Hey guys, it's Bradley with the Insurance Guys Podcast here. The Glovebox app is a self-service platform that connects directly to the carrier systems. I was so impressed when I saw this for the first time because it's not reliant on our management system data. And let's be honest, no matter how strict you are with your management system, the data is not going to be super clean always. Glovebox connects to all carriers via direct API integration, which is insane, guys. The number of carriers they have on this platform is ridiculous. The co-founders of Glovebox are former agency owners of a large $100 million agency. This app will decrease service, increase leads, increase retention, and increase revenue. It's, it's made by agents for agents, which is the whole ethos behind the Insurance Guys podcast. Check out Glovebox. Tell them the Insurance Guys sent you. You will get 20% off of your monthly subscription for life. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for I Protect Insurance and Financial Services, based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, he is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama, parade first team All-American, rivals five-star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? Best I've ever been. Best I've ever been. I love it, man. You look rested. You look like maybe baby Luke is giving you a reprieve from your SEAL team buds training. <laughs> I got uh, three nights in a row of six-hour stretches of sleep. So there you go. I am more rested today than I have been since September the 4th of 2021. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, Bradley, I've been excited about having our guest on this podcast today, and I've kind of giggled to myself. I'll tell you why. Uh, when we did the One City World Tour, his son, Aaron Gordon, sat on a panel and I, I believe you introduced him. I can't remember if it was you or somebody else. But one thing you left out of the introduction was that Aaron is one of like four or five people in the United States of America, I believe in the world, that has the particular insurance designations that he has. And I got to laughing about the fact that I hope nobody at the One City World Tour walked up to Aaron and tried to big boy him with like saying, you know, I, I've got my CIC designation. <laughs> and he's like, that's cute. That's cute. Yeah. But yeah. guys, Hey, we have got a fantastic guest today. I want to just get into it with him because, you know, I think it's important, Bradley, that we have people like him on this podcast from a historical standpoint, if if for no other reason, because I think it's uh, I think it's important for younger insurance agents that are out there to yep. understand the history of insurance and the guys that that have been doing it for a long time. And this particular guest is somebody that I think they can all learn from. And if 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 for nothing else, just to kind of get a flavor for what things were like way back before they were born in the insurance industry. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, there's certain people that paved the way that dealt with some, I don't know, I want to say like, like difficult things in the industry, but that makes it easier for guys like me, you, and even Aaron to be even just as successful in our day and age. So I think right. it's good to, to have those conversations. I completely agree. Guys, without further ado, he's going to help us row this boat just a little closer to the lighthouse today, and I am privileged and honored to give him the introduction that he has always deserved. He is originally from Brooklyn, New York. He currently resides in Manhattan, New York. He is married to the beautiful Goldie and has five children and 15 grandchildren. He has been a licensed insurance agent since 1958. He is the founder and president of the Gordon Company since its inception in December of 1968. For over 30 years, he has served as the founder, secretary, and captive manager for the Delaware Professional Insurance Company and Medical Specialties Insurance Purchasing Group. He has been a member of the Professional Liability Underwriting Society, PLUS, and is credited with assisting in the formation of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my profound honor today to introduce to you first-time guest on the IGP, 
Mr. David Gordon. How are you, David? I'm doing fine, thank you. David, I am so thrilled to have you with us today. And I think it's important that we go back and start with a start. And I know all of these agents that are listening to this today want to hear, I know I want to hear what it was like in the 50s, 60s, 70s to be in the insurance industry. You were right in the middle of all that. Kind of take us back in time today. Let these agents know some history on kind of what was going on back in those times and those days and just bring us up to today. Well, I guess the greatest difference that I see in the industry, not in, not in my particular situation, is that there are now giant insurance companies and giant insurance brokers. In 1958, when I started in the insurance business, there were no giants such as we see now. The firm that I worked for had maybe eight, my first firm had maybe eight employees, and we were the insurance broker for the 1964 World's Fair. So you might have said, my gosh, today that would go to Marsh or Aon or Willis, uh, one of the giants. In that time, we had interstate department stores. We had giant accounts. We were a small broker. So I think that's a big difference. And I guess if you think about the world, you know, Lloyd's was way over there. Right. Munich Re was way over there. It was a rare thing that you ever communicated with them. You communicated by teletype and it was very rare. Mm. And you didn't see those people and they didn't participate in much of the business. So I think the size of the companies and the size of the brokers has changed dramatically in all these years. That's the first thing that I would observe. And I think the second is, and we certainly exemplify it, this was a father-son business. Mm -hmm. Unquestionably, there were a few father-daughters, but most of the time this business was father-son and it was a family business. Even the big firms were family firms. There was a Mr. Caroon. There, was, there, there were all these other people in the business. There was Mr. Chubb. Right. There were several Mr. Chubbs, in fact. Right. And you, when you saw these people, you saw an icon of the business different than what you see today. These were real insurance people. Tell so us. I guess that you know those are the trends that I see most different. And the other, I think, and excuse me, young guys, is the lack of education now in our business. Mm. I had to learn how to read a fire map. I had to learn how to measure square footage in a building. I had to learn the difference between a wet pipe sprinkler system and a dry pipe sprinkler system. So I don't see that level of education any longer in our business. An underwriter underwrites, uh, an engineer goes out and looks. The underwriter doesn't go with the engineer. Mm. So I think that, that the trends that we're seeing that you young people are seeing are quite different than what I saw learning at the feet of a real underwriter. I completely agree with everything you just said. The other question I had, and I've heard, you know, I've had dinner with, with men and women that were in the industry back in those times. And one of the things I find fascinating is the systems that you guys used back then <laughs> were, and you kind of briefly mentioned this earlier when you were talking about teletype and, and, and how you just, th th there wasn't that constant communication like there is now through email. And, but talk to these young, younger agents that are listening to this about some of those systems that you guys uh, used in those early days to ride insurance. So let, let me start you off with a simple one. We did not have copy machines right. such as you have. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't go to a machine, put a piece of paper in and out came a copy. We had a wet process copier. I'm talking about 1958, 59, 60. And the stuff that came out of it was ugly, mm -hmm. really ugly. And changing it and changing the chemicals and changing the other things was what the street boy did. Right. So- to begin with, what was a street boy? That was my first job. And Aaron will verify that this is, I think, my greatest historic story. But I used to go around every day to the underwriters with a bag, a briefcase, full of binders. And a binder then was a much larger description of a risk than it is today. It was the height of the building, the other occupancy of the building, the square footage, what was adjacent to the building, how far from a fire hydrant, et cetera. And I would ask the underwriter to please review it and sign and sign on on the binder. And I hope this anecdote gets published. But one night at, I was going to school at night. And one night at five o'clock, I approached an underwriter at American Surety Company with a binder. 
And he said, I'll look at that binder tomorrow morning. It's too late tonight. I want to go home. And I was very grumpy about it because in the morning I had other work to do and I had to get to school. So I said, gee, would you please look at it? He said, no, no, I'm too tired. As I put the binder back into my briefcase, he saw that I was carrying a copy of Jowett's translation of Plato. And he said to me, you're reading Jowett? And I said, yes, I am. He said, we need to discuss that, but let me first sign the binder. (laughs) I think that if you think of that today, of literally going to an underwriter's desk every day, maybe twice a day, Mm. of meeting the underwriter in a bar at 5.30 at night, if you think about the fact that it was very much person to person, not anything like you see it today. Yeah. It was rare that you spoke to an underwriter on the phone. You went to the desk. As now, you do in now, London. now it's rare that you speak to them on the phone. It's through chat bots and stuff. I wish I could speak to some of my underwriters on the phone. I, I think, you know, if you went to the London before COVID and you went to Lloyd's, you would see the way we did business a little, a little different, but we did business going from desk to desk. That's how they do it there. Mm-hmm. Scott and I actually have an invite to go to Lloyd's just kind of waiting on things to open back up. And I want to go just for that reason, just to see. Oh, it. I'm going. I'm going. David, uh, it, I, I have a lot of questions for you. I had an unusual question that I've never asked you and I've never asked your son, but I'm very intrigued with. So, you know, wor- worst disaster, arguably in American history, is the World Trade Center disaster. And you guys had a front row seat to that. Literally. 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 Where were you that day, that morning when it happened, and how did it affect your insurance business moving forward for the next year after that happened? I was in my office. The news came across the line. I was very concerned. My kids were in school. Right. High school. Uh, high school, was a neighborhood at that time. school and I live 30 blocks from my home. Right. Uh, I was in my office and I could see the dust. Mm. I, I, I was on the east side of Manhattan on East 46th Street, and I could literally look out my window looking south and see dust. I could not see the buildings. It was a horrible shock, horrible shock. And I literally physically walked home, which was only 30 blocks, unable to conceive of what I was participating in. Right. A friend of mine, now deceased, was on an airplane taking off from Newark Airport, a very dear friend. And the pilot said, something has just happened at the World Trade Center. I'm going to take a vote as to whether you want to take off or not. So they voted not to take off. My friend went to his apartment in Jersey City, where he could see the World Trade Center, and did not get up to go to the bathroom for 24 hours. That's how mesmerized the city was. Right. So the after effect was traumatic. How it affected the insurance business? I don't don't think it did. Uh, This is one man's opinion, but... It affected some people like Alexander and Alexander had an office in a high floor of the World Trade Center. Right. So that they those people were traumatized. Mm. Those that got out. Right. Were traumatized. We have a friend who was literally walking up the front steps and she asked her, her, her firm to transfer her out of New York. She could not stand being in New York after that. So there were certain individuals that were traumatized. But, you know, when you think about that, it's a very localized kind of a trauma. So I say to you, where you guys are, you heard about it, but it wasn't what we felt like, gosh, the dust, the loss of life to the insurance business, to other businesses. My oldest son's best friend died in the World Trade Center. My oldest son has never recovered Mm. from the emotion of losing his best friend. Right. So I don't think it affected the insurance business at all. Well, I've always wondered kind of how that shook out. You know, we had something... Similar happened here in Alabama on April 27th, 2011. We had a all day tornado outbreak. You, you know, either had someone who had their home blown away or a friend that passed away. Don't even believe that though was, was as, it wasn't as traumatic. I don't believe as the world trade center, of course, that's all relative, right? If you were one of the people that had your house blown away and your kids got killed, well then, yeah, that's probably just as traumatic, but A very similar situation. I I, I told somebody one time, I said, I'm not sure everybody in the state of Alabama doesn't need therapy after that. 
and you could probably say the same for for what happened at the World Trade Centers. It's uh, everybody was deeply, deeply impacted by that. And I've just always wondered, being in the insurance business in Manhattan, how you guys felt about that and how that kind of played out for you. I personally know the judge who adjudicated the insurance issues mm -hmm. revolving around that loss. Mm -hmm. And I think for the insurance business, per se, it was a big loss, but I don't think it was a, as giant a loss as, as we might think. Didn't the World Trade Centers, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but I read somewhere recently where a gentleman had purchased the World Trade Centers not long before that happened, and then this all ends up in court because the insurance companies that had the World Trade Center insured there was issues with coverage and what was covered and what was not covered. And so they ended up having to all go to court to kind of figure out what the final payout was. So I want to be, be careful not to name too many names. Sure. But the guy who built the, the World Trade Center was a very famous New York realtor. And the debate about the claim was, was it one loss or two losses? That's what it was. That's right. And it was adjudicated to be one loss. Gotcha. And he subsequently built the new World Trade Center with, with federal help right, and some other buildings. Uh, so I don't know whether you'd say he came out okay or didn't come out okay. Mm -hmm. But I think that teaches you a key lesson and all the young folks who will see this broadcast should focus on that detail. When he purchased insurance, what did he think he bought? Mm -hmm. I think if you want a lesson from history, you better know what you're doing in this business today, even more than you had to know, know 50 years ago. Agreed. Because there's an attorney around the corner. Mm -hmm. David, it's funny that you bring that up. I was driving down the road the other day and I was thinking about this and it kind of goes along with what you're saying right now. I thought, you know, now more than ever, the importance of having a true risk manager and an independent agent that, that really knows what they're doing is probably more important than it has ever been because, and this kind of goes along with what you're saying, especially with, with things like business insurance and homeowners insurance, it seems like there's a lot of companies that have stripped away a lot of coverages that you would just buy, let's say, if you were paying, if you were buying a policy on the internet and it's the insurance agent's job because now all those coverages that used to be standard practice on just a, a policy, it was just in the policy. Now you have to add a lot of that stuff back in. So you have to ask great questions and then you have to understand, okay, we need to check this box and we need to check this box because these people really need those coverages used to just be part of it. But now with a lot of carriers, those endorsements, you have to kind of go in and know what you're doing to be able to give them the right coverage that they need. Would you agree with that? Oh, boy. I remember when someone had to teach me the difference between all risk coverage and all risk coverage. Right. There is no such thing as all risk coverage. Right. You know, people were foolish enough to accept those words as the, gu as the guiding light. Right. In, in buying insurance and thinking that all risk coverage means no exclusions and no limitations. Yep. And there is a policy written on the face of this earth that doesn't have limitations and exclusions. Right. So I think that's a very important lesson. Yes. But, but what troubles me, and Aaron is, is not an example of this, but because he had to learn how to read an insurance policy, is I'm not sure that our agents and brokers today read the policies. Yeah. I would agree with that. I'll give you an anecdote. And Aaron is part of this conversation. We have a client that's very, very needing. And I'm not sure some days why we keep this client. We all have one of those. But Aaron gave the client a proposal the other day from a new insurance company going from company A to company B. Mm -hmm. And the client wrote back, I'd like a line by line comparison of the two policies. Mm -hmm. And Aaron's mother, Goldie, said, you, you mean the 42 pages are one policy and the 46 are the other? You want a line-by-line line comparison? And the client said yes. 
And Goldie said, we just don't have the time to do that for you. You either have to trust our mm -hmm. judgment or not. Right. But think about that for a minute. Yep. Uh, again, if I wanted to focus, and I'm sorry to be so repetitive, you know, sit down and read the policy that you're selling, guys. Mm -hmm. What's funny about that is I don't know who the two carriers are, but they were probably like Chubb and CNA. It was like two really solid carriers. So Aaron must have told you the story. He didn't. No, he did not. He did not. I have it not was heard the going story. from CNA to Chubb. Oh, where, oh, that's that was just a lucky guess. I do so, know that you guys have a lot of the business with CNA and Chubb. He has told me that, but that's interesting. I have a question in regards to New York. I love as an Alabamian, I love New York City. Two part question. I think it was either Benjamin Franklin or just one of, one of the founding fathers said that when all the banks in the world go out of business, the insurance companies will still be standing. As if to say insurance is one of the strongest industries you can be in. What's it like running an insurance agency, selling insurance, while also being in New York City, which I consider to be the center of the world, and Manhattan, which is to, to me, the epicenter of New York City, what's it like? And do you ever consider the gravity of that? Because it's, it's a, to me, it seems way more noble than me in, in Alabama selling insurance. I, I'll tell you an anecdote about that. And then I'll try to answer the question. But many years ago, we, had, we, in, we represented an advertising agency on Times Square. And they occupied a, a, a floor of, of a building that at the base of which was a theater, it was a tall skyscraper, it's still there. We don't represent that agency anymore. And we were placing the coverage for the agency's property insurance. So let's say just, just uh, I'm picking a number, I don't remember the numbers. Let's say it was 20,000 square feet. And let's say the, the uh, build out was $10 million. And let's say the office contents was $15 million. And we had an underwriter in Florida. And the underwriter declined the account. And we called him, he was the, and we said, why are you declining the account? He said, we don't insure real estate in Manhattan. And I said, this is not real estate. This is a office on a floor of an office building. And he said, 25 million in property values? And I said, yes. And he said, no, nah, that's not possible. <laughs> So the problem or the difference here is the scale. Yeah. And when you think about billions, there's a building at 420 Park Avenue that for a while was the largest apartment house in the United States. And we had one client who for a while who had an apartment there worth $90 million, an apartment. Now, you can't tell me that there are many cities in the world where a building is worth 90 million. Any buildings worth 90 apartment. million in Huntsville, Scott? No, probably not. You know, the concentration of values in New yeah. York, the terrorism risk in New York, yep. Yep. all have huge, huge implications. Uh, and the age of our, our, of our residential buildings has huge implications in property insurance and in casualty insurance. Mm -hmm. So the problem people face is scale. Yeah. Similarly, when I went to Florida to talk to a, a broker colleague there, and he was telling me about their problems with property cover. Yep. And I was sitting and saying, my God, I didn't know that there was no markets here. Yep. You can't yep. get an admitted market to write pro property insurance in Florida, period. Nope. And then beyond that, their capacity continues to shrink to where it is today, which is almost non-existent. Well, but 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 there are reasons for that. And there are reasons for what New York faces. Right. I we had a client across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral. They've gone through four brokers in four years trying to save money. They can't yep. do it. People promise them whatever they want, but you can't place property insurance across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral. You know, if you, you know, there's a great story I tell. I'm hesitant to name the company, but, but there was a company that moved out of New York because the CEO said in the early 50s that the range of an atomic bomb could destroy the company. They were headquartered in New York. So he took a compass. He stuck the point into the Empire State Building and moved 28 miles out because the range of an atomic bomb at that time was 25 miles. 
And I said, I said to him, I happened to meet him at, at a part of my career, and I said, I, I got to ask you a question. You know, the atomic bomb hits New York. 14 million people are either killed or mangled. And you're worried about your company surviving that, sitting 28 miles out? You got to be kidding. Yeah. So I think being in New York gives you a whole different kind of a view. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the agency that I was most impressed with, and I'll name this because it was 50 years ago, I was working for John Hancock at the time, and I flew out to meet one of our life insurance producers, and he, he ran an agency called Hoynes Labar. If they're listening, I'd love it. And this was way out Midwest, and I got off at Des Moines Airport and drove for an hour and a half to their town and drove up a hill, and there was this office building tiny little office building sitting on the top of a hill. And I went in and I met these people. I actually have one of their giveaways. And we got to talking about the insurance business. They didn't write package policies. They wrote property policies and casualty policies. I was getting 17.5% commission on, on property and 15% on casualty, something like that, or 22.5% and 17.5%. And, and I thought I was making real money, you know? And I said, so what do you do? He said, oh, well, we have, uh, we get 25% on property. We get 32% on casualty. And we have a contingency arrangement based on profitability. Now I'm looking at this building <laughs> sitting on the top of a hill in Iowa. And I think I know the insurance business. So That's I awesome. think there's lessons to be learned both ways. Right. So on that note, so if you take a difficult market like New York, Florida, South Alabama is very, where I'm located is very similar market to Florida, you know, California, West coast with all the wild wildfires, you know, in your career, would you rather deal with a difficult market like what we deal with, or would you have rather been in Ohio or Nebraska where everything was a lot different? And I don't want to say easier, but compared to some of the more difficult markets, it is, you know, Aaron and I have a friend, Andrew Ryan. We always laugh at the, the juxtaposition of Ohio, where he's located, and Alabama, where no carriers want to be in Alabama or Florida. Everybody wants to be in Ohio. Which would you rather have? Now, that's a really good, challenging question. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly would rather be here or in Florida or in California for many reasons, one of which is social. When I interact with the underwriters and the clients here in New York, I'm interacting at a level different than yeah. than you interact with in a rural or mm -hmm. a small city. I'm getting the, my branch underwriter is writing a hundred million with a branch underwriter in, you name it, it hasn't seen the number a hundred million in his life. My branch in New York has 95 people. Their branch has nine and a half people. So the interaction with the client and the, the market is completely different here. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some advantages to there because it's higher to fire your broker when you have lunch, when your wife has lunch with his wife every day <laughs> at the local cafe. So there's a big difference here in competitiveness. Mm -hmm. But but we're on our game, you know, Aaron and I, six, six days a week, 24-6. Yeah. Uh, you can be off your game in a, in a rural environment or a small city and not have to work those kind of hours. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think our competition is at a different level, but so is yeah. our so is our activity. Right. You can't enough. where you are. You can't walk into the home office and talk to the most senior underwriter. Right. Right. We can Although I have done that before. What? I said I have done that before, but not. But I'm often. saying it's difficult. Yeah, it is. It is. You've got to make an appointment. You've got to fly in, etc. You know, guys. If there's a lesson all of us can teach the insurance companies is the value we have in the transaction. Yes. I don't think they figured that out yet. Mm -hmm. David, I had a question that I've talked to Aaron about a few times, and I want to help all these agents out here understand this because I don't want to that deep dive too far into this, but you're kind of a pioneer in a lot of ways. In my, my opinion, talk to these, these agents that are listening today about how you learned about and kind of, I guess, uh, became an agent that started a captive program in the 
the the medical space, I know, and I, I like I said, don't want to deep dive too far into this, but how did that come about? I know that you know you were instrumental in in doing starting that for your agency there years ago, but how did that happen? How did you get into the the captive program business? I had the blessing of being involved with John Hancock, which was a wonderful insurance company that decided to open a division to serve professionals, specifically physicians. And they needed a property casualty arm, so they hired me. So for three years, from 1968 to 1971, I traveled the United States with a John Hancock business card. And therefore, I had a ticket into almost any door that I wanted, a bank, an insurance company, Mm -hmm. the medical profession. And as a result of that, I learned some information. I acquired information and knowledge about medicine that 99.99% of the brokers don't have or couldn't get. Mm. And I had the luck to testify before Congress in behalf of the American Board of Medical Specialties about the medical malpractice crisis. And And a journal was published in 1972 about that testimony. The point is, when you're inside the House of Medicine and you learn about the issues there from their perspective, not from our perspective, what does a physician feel like when they have a tough patient to handle, a complicated patient, and they know that there's a potential for litigation. What do they feel like when they open that envelope? And as a result of that, I felt that the insurance business didn't understand, and frankly, my friends will hate me for this, still doesn't understand the visceral inside feelings of the House of Medicine. I represented a hospital as a consultant And they had a $15 million insurance budget. And then they hired me as their broker. And that was a big account. And one day I yelled at the CFO saying, you know, Marty, he should rest in peace. You know, Marty, I got a $15 million budget here that I'm handling for you. And damn it, I can't get through to you on the phone. And he said, David, I have a $500 million budget, 480 million of which comes from the state of New York. You get Friday afternoon from 3 to 3.30. That's it, buddy. You know, we think that we're so important in that equation. So that led me to believe that the House of Medicine would be better off managing its own affairs than depending upon people who didn't feel the feel, understand the chemistry of the business. And that led me to form several captives. Right. So you guys have one client that has been with you for 53 years. What is that like? What's it like to have a client for 53 years? And how has that relationship evolved over time? And I have a follow-up question after that. So that client is in the Bronx and they're an oil dealer. And I met them through my original boss, who was a real estate broker. And when I met them, the only thing we got was their personal insurance. They were clients of Liberty Mutual. And then they had a falling out. They hired me as a consultant. They had a falling out. Uh, We had a falling out with Liberty Mutual. When we found that their engineer knew nothing about trucking, and didn't know that, that the, the right side mirror was the West Coast mirror, not the right side mirror, and didn't know what the tires looked like, et cetera. And they decided that they would, they would appoint us as their commercial insurance broker, which they did in 1968. It's a family firm, and I'm now dealing with the third generation of that firm. There was a time in my life when I was going through a lot of turmoil in the early 80s, and the CEO called me in one day, and on his desk was a pile of proposals and a box with a bottle of of, uh, champagne and glasses from various brokers. And he said, look, David, you've been doing okay for a few years, but you slacked off the last year or two. Here are all these proposals. Straighten out your act, or I'm going to open one of them. And that that account means probably uh, more to me than our largest account. And I treasure that relationship, dealing with the third generation. It means a lot to me. But I've never been dishonest with them. 
I've only told them the facts. And that's why we're not a big broker, because we will not be dishonest with the client. Mm. So it, it, I treasure that relationship. And, I, and if I may, I know we only have a few minutes. I want to tell you about another relationship that sure. Aaron saw happen. One day we were driving down to Delaware to our captive and the phone rang and it was the former claims manager of a very large insurance company he had retired. And I said, how are you doing? And he said, fine. I said, what's going on? And he said, David, I've looked around. I'm having trouble with, with um, my current insurance company. And I decided I need a new broker. And it's you. And I started to cry as I was driving my car down the New Jersey Turnpike. Now, this guy could have called the CEO of any major or minor broker in the United States. And he called that's us. Awesome. So that's another one that I treasure. And we that's also awesome. represent the CEO of one of the companies that we deal with. So longevity means honesty and straightforwardness. Here and if go. the client doesn't want to hear that, they're going to go elsewhere. Amen. And you want them to go elsewhere. Bradley, yeah. what was, what was um, your follow-up question? Follow-up question. When you think about your career, are there any deals that you didn't get that's like, mm, that's the one that got away? Oh, more than one. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We represented the, the American College of Emergency Physicians for many years. We were their designated broker. And they, they evolved into very large groups. And we represented all of the very, very large groups. And one of them was a, was a, and it was a 1231 program renewal date for everybody. And literally on midnight, on New Year's Eve, I bound the renewal for a very large group. And the day after New Year's Day, they told us they had replaced us. Mm. So sure, that one got away. That'll make your skin crawl. Oh, and then I once had, a, uh, we, we had another huge program and it was a foreign insurance company. And they sent some people over. And the people they sent over had no concept of underwriting. And they took me to a restaurant and they tried to get me drunk. And I poured the drink into the plant next to me. <laughs> and they said, so how many physicians do we insure? And I forget the number. It was many years ago. I said, you know, a thousand physicians. And they said, uh, what's the limit? The average limit? I said, well, we write 1 million, 3 million, 2 million, 4 million. And and uh, 3 million, 5 million. So maybe the average is 2 million, 4 million. So they did the math and they multiplied 2 million, 4 million by a thousand. And they said, that's more than the assets that we have at the company. I said, yeah, I mean, compare that to USAA or to, you know, to any of these huge insurance companies. They have millions of limits of 100,000 out. He said, uh, yeah, but this is medical malpractice. And boy, we've got to get off this one. And they did. I had to fire 23 people that when they did that. Oh, wow. I wow. cried that day, too. Mm, I bet. David, I want to end this podcast with one question, and it's more of a statement than a question, but uh, I don't know any of your other children, but I can't tell you how much I think of your son, Aaron. And I've always said you can tell a lot about somebody by their parents, you know, the environment they grew up with, the people that they surround themselves with. So I want to I want to say to you and to Goldie, what a wonderful job, at least with Aaron. Again, I don't know your other four kids. What a wonderful job you did. But here's what I want you to do as we end this podcast today. You've got 15 grandchildren, and they won't care anything about listening to this right now. But 10 or 15 years from now, they're going to want to hear this podcast, and they're going to have a chance to listen to their grandfather talk, talk about his life in the insurance industry. Speak to them for just a second. What would you like to say to them about your legacy and uh, anything you want to say to them? Because I promise you, those 15 grandchildren one day will listen to this. I, um, you know, when you hit the age of 81 and you've got all kinds of medical challenges, this is not something that you don't think about. Right. So don't think that I, that I don't have locked in the safe a legacy letter for my children and grandchildren. Awesome. I do have that. I think about my legacy a lot. I don't end a phone conversation with any of my children or grandchildren without saying I love you, because I believe that when it's all over, I want them to know that the last words they heard from their father and grandfather were I love you. Mm. First of all, I think Aaron is a wonderful exemplar. And I think that his devotion to his parents, his devotion to his family, his devotion to his faith and his devotion to his business. He's made himself a very young professional. 
But I think the only message I want to leave for my 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 children, my my children's spouses and my grandchildren is that I love them. And I then they they make my life very valuable. You know, my wife has given me 38 and a half years, one wonderful years. I'm not saying the beginning was easy, but I can say it was wonderful. My children have kind of rounded it out mm. to a real life. And my grandchildren are the joy. There's nothing but joy in grandchildren. So Grand- I guess that's my message. Grandchildren are the exclamation point. No, they really make it makes all the heartache worth it. I have one grandchild that I have with, with whom I have breakfast every day, five days a week. Mm. And we have a 15 minute time together. And that starts my day. I treasure it. Mm. And I have Aaron, thank God, all day long with me. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, money is important. Don't get me wrong. It makes comfort easier and security easier. But without family, there's nothing. There really is nothing. David, I just want to say thank you again for you coming on the show today. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to Bradley. And I honor you. I think that your career in the insurance industry has been tremendous. You certainly are a first ballot Hall of Famer in the insurance industry. <laughs> and uh, thank you. We, we as younger agents that follow behind you, I think we need to do a better job of understanding the legacy of men like you that as Bradley said earlier, are, are the shoulders that we stand on now. Can and I just give you one last suggestion? Absolutely. To a young, to all the young people listening to this? Sure. Absolutely. When you're negotiating a deal with an underwriter, sit on their side of the table. Mm, absolutely. That's a great point. I, I thank some, you so much for giving me this opportunity. It gave me an hour of fun. Well, to what you just said, I think sometimes we forget. That we yes. need to sit on, sit in their shoes for a minute that's, and try. That's going to gonna be the title of the episode. Yeah, absolutely, David. Thank you so much for being here today. As I always end every podcast, guys, rewards come from action, not discussion. Get your ass out from behind that desk today, and do what David Gordon has done since 1958: build relationships. Build relationships, make money for your family, for your wife, for your husband, for your kids' college fund, for your parents that are struggling out there today. Let that be your wine. Go out there today and go sell the shit out of insurance. Write good business for the agencies that you represent and write good business for the companies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, man. Thanks, David. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. David, we love you too. And anytime you want to come back on, you have an open invitation anytime. We mean that. Absolutely. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being a part of our family, and we'll see you back real soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at scott at iprotectinsurance.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to portalinsurance.com or email him at bradley at portalinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. We thank you so much for listening to our show and being a part of our family. And we look forward to seeing you again next week on the next episode of the Insurance Guys podcast. Take care.